Hey, aloha, everybody. Welcome back to the Think Tech Hawaii studios for another episode of Security Matters. I'm Andrew, the security guy. And today, my guest, Ryan Schoenfield, is the founder and CEO of RAS Watch. Um, I think one of the more progressive companies in our industry. And I think you're going to find out why today. Uh, Ryan, take, thanks for taking so much time out of your schedule. I know you're a busy guy, man. With uh, with those kind of titles behind you, you know, there's there's never any rest for the weary. All right. Thanks for having me. No worries, man. So, um, uh, a lot of our audience may know you and know RAS Watch. I know I've, I was on a, another panel with you, so you've, you've definitely had some industry exposure. Um, but maybe take some uh, some time to share um, share your, uh, sort of your history in the industry um, as much as you want to share. You know, I know in this day and age we don't we don't give everything away about ourselves because everybody hunts us down via social media and steals all of our info. But uh, <laughs> whatever you think can uh, let our audience get to know you a little bit and uh, some of your vision for uh, RAS Watch. Yeah, it's been a. Uh been an interesting road. So I, I started my career in law enforcement on the, uh, the East Coast. Uh, and I was always kind of a weird guy examining the role of technology and crime. Um, so I was, a, I was a cop that went and got a master's in IT, uh, specifically system design and development. And, and since then have focused on kind of the intersection of crime and uh, technology and, and security and technology since my move to the private sector. Um, I've been a consultant and instructor for the State Department, training foreign governments in high-tech crimes and investigations. And then since moving to the private sector, I've worked in the contract guard world and as an end user, as a manager of global investigations and then head of global security technology for a, a global fortune company. Um, left, left the end user space and started our uh, consulting firm where we worked in a lot of different verticals, but one of them is uh, fast moving tech companies. And uh, one of the things we found with those folks is they would close large rounds of funding, double, triple the size of the company in a matter of, of months or a year. Um, and that the security teams and infrastructure there weren't necessarily scaling with the business. Mm. And so RAS Watch was kind of born out of, of that need for our customers um, where they didn't either have the capital or weren't going to invest the capital in, in growing that program. And so we built essentially a uh, fully baked security program that they could subscribe to as a service with, with no big capital investment. That's amazing. Did the, um, how, how, um, how frustrating for you back to your investigative days, how frustrating was it to go to a, the technology people who should have some, you know, data, maybe evidentiary, maybe not, uh, and then, oh, it wasn't working, or oh, we 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 don't have it, or oh, that's already been written over. Um, did uh, was some of this born out of that? Because you know what you're doing is quite proactive versus the reactive nature of a lot of security, especially on the investigative side. I'd say that uh, the majority of my entire career to date has been driven largely by frustration. Um, <laughs> as, a, as as a police officer, you know, the, the criminals, they were always ahead of us. Um, they were yeah. leveraging technologies in ways that we couldn't keep up with uh, from an investigative standpoint. And as, a, as an end user, um, you know, there were so many ways to leverage technology to make our program uh, more proactive, catch people faster, have higher close rates. Um, so my career largely has been driven by how we can leverage technology, um, and really because I've come into kind of roles in historically antiquated functions that could have been optimized by tech and, mm -hmm. and looking for ways in which to do that. Wow. We, we surely need that sort of fresh perspective. I think a lot of, um, I, I did military law enforcement, which was even, we had no tools at all, but, um, the, that's a, a bit of a dated industry in some cities, not all, you know, you see, uh, New Orleans is doing some stuff with their, it's not owned by law enforcement per se, but they've got their city, smart city, you know, uh, mm -hmm. application going on that, that the, the police and law enforcement can use uh, as a subscriber, things like that. So I love that model. Um, you mentioned that some of the uh, enterprise customers you had initially had trouble scaling out um, their departments. What, um, tell, tell us a little bit more about that. Was that, a, was it driven by just the people or was it a lack of knowledge about how to do that? Or was it just the inability to invest in, you know, the, the heavy hardware lift or whatever it may be to, uh, to scale program? I think it's a combination of everything you just listed. Um, so okay. for some companies, you know, while capital isn't technically the problem, especially after you close a major funding round, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that investing all of that capital and security 
is where your investors want it spent. Yeah. Um, you know, as, as most people are accustomed, security is generally seen as a cost center within an organization. Um, so in the venture world and um, venture backed company world, you know, people want capital spent in areas that's going to drive increased valuations, drive them to their next financial milestones and security is not seen as that. So that's where the capital piece comes in. Um, but the other piece too is in, in a lot of the tech world where companies are moving quickly or, or even are launching without any physical infrastructure from a technology and an IT perspective on site. And the physical security world is a, has been a little slow to adopt to cloud first initiatives and um, the ability to either virtualize or just leverage other companies' infrastructure. There's so you see these companies where the only server on site is the recording server for the VMS or, or for their access control system. Um, and in many cases, that was a fight even to get in. Um, but it's this uh, disparity between what a lot of the physical security practitioners see as the right way to do things. And uh, one of the things that frustrates me to no end, the way we've always done it. Um, and the way that IT within organizations are, are moving to the cloud and, and leveraging new technology. Yeah, I've been, it's, I think it's not, I, I don't want to say sad, but I think it's remiss of most of our integration, integrator population to go out and assess an organization's needs and, and see that they're entirely in the cloud. Oh, but I'm going to drop a server on-prem, which, you know, they're not going to update. They're not going to patch they're if they even know if the AC stays on all night long to keep the thing cool. I mean, you know, there's just a lot of problems with dropping these boxes into organizations that don't have IT people there to take care of them. Um, I, I still think that's 80% of the integrators out there. I mean, what's your, your take on, are you, are you the 1%? Are you the 10% with, with your approach? Um, probably more than one, less than 10. Um, <laughs> Good but, uh, you know, we're, we're not an integration company. Um, we partner with integrators. So I, I certainly have nothing against the integration community. I think if, if nothing else, COVID should be um, a wake up call to that community about some of the ways in which they've historically done business, the types of work that they go after. Um, you know, you and I have spoken before about the recurring revenue model versus the project-based model and, and, and what that means to companies like right now. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a real challenge to, um, if you don't evolve um, to stay relevant. And I think that's the problem we're having right now. Yeah. Um, so tell me about the consumer appetite. Um, obviously an organization that's, you know, living in the cloud digests, security oh you got it in the cloud awesome we'll, we'll take it you know that's an easy buy um do you get calls from folks still who have a have traditionally had their stuff on prem and want to move or are they on prem and they just heard about you and they want to know how you could help and augment and they they you know is it is it is it still a, a, a teaching sort of a of a call quite often absolutely probably more teaching than anything uh, okay. um, you know i think uh, one of the things where uh, the integrators in their road to evolution here, um, I think need to understand, it's not just, it's everybody, needs to really understand or help the end users understand what cloud really means. Um, and when you're looking at the cost of cloud services, because that's, I'd say one of the number one reasons that somebody doesn't go with a cloud solution is either they don't understand what it really means or they don't understand how to truly calculate the ROI um, and total cost of ownership. Because they'll see this, uh, I could pay $10,000 for a server now, but if I go a cloud model, I have to make these payments every month into infinity. Um, but they don't understand, you know, the, the true total cost of ownership of that. You know, that you may buy that one server now, but over time, the infrastructure, the maintenance, the power, the, you know, the on-site IT support, whereas, you know, in a, in a truly hosted cloud model, um, how much of that is done for you and, and what the cost savings look like over time. Yeah. And especially these, the non, a non IT centric organization. I mean, it's, it's just a win-win. Yeah. Here we pay 41, 41 cents a kilowatt hour. So the power, 
consumption and the cooling or paying for the cooling to cool the servers is another piece a lot of people don't calculate in there and the cloud model wins wins quite often we've got some commercial clients um that are we have fully in the cloud I do have like a firewall on their premise because they didn't even have anyone to, to run a firewall for them. So I do that and manage it remotely. But um, so when the when the, the market, so I understand sort of the market you went in, could you give us a range of the sort of client base that you've, you've been successful with that say moving from prem or that contacted you and that you were able to say, hey, look, here's what we get, you know, sort of the low end and the high end, you know, and the, and the range of differences for some of those. Sure. So Watch is, uh, is a pretty new company. We locked, launched in uh, the tail end of 2019, um, okay. which also, you know, going into a pandemic certainly wasn't, uh, wasn't part of our roadmap, just like <laughs> for, uh, for many companies. But uh, um, our focus when we launched was really looking at uh, middle market companies that uh, were growing and probably weren't primed for an internal operations center at least within the next couple of years, maybe it was on their roadmap a couple of years out when they uh, saw more growth. Um, and an interesting thing happened when we quietly started talking in the market to our contacts about the, the business was the first five companies to approach us about interest had internal GSOCs. Oh. Um, and so, you know, while that wasn't originally part of our plan to go after that market sector originally, um, what we were finding is organizations were spending a lot of money on programs. They were minimally effective um, in terms of showing ROI. And we even had one company say, look, if you can save us money and just not do a worse job than our GSOC, <laughs> then we would call that a win. Um, now, okay. that would never be, you know, my metric for success. But it was, just, <laughs> it, it was an interesting revelation to me in terms of who the potential market was. Um, and how underserved the, the space is. You know, certainly there's uh, companies out there today that do video monitoring as a service and do different pieces of what a GSOC offers. Um, what we wanted to launch was the ability for an organization to come in with any range of a security program or no security program at all and have what they need from, you know, whether it was monitoring and access control, whether it's uh, intelligence, travel tracking, mass communication, social media monitoring, the stuff you'd expect to see in a large fortune security program to have any or all of that as a service, but also we provide it in a white labeled service so that it, it feels like it's their in-house program as opposed to some third party vendor. That is brilliant. Um, I want to get into the GSOC services more a little bit. Uh, we're going to take a break. I'm going to pay some bills for about one minute and we'll be right back with uh, Ryan Schofield. Aloha, I'm Lillian Cumi, host of Lillian's Vegan World, the show where we talk about veganism and the plant-based diet located in Honolulu, Hawaii. I'm a vegan chef and cooking instructor, and I have lots of uh, information to share with you about how awesome this plant-based diet is. So do tune in every second Thursday from 1 p.m. Aloha. Hey, aloha. Welcome back to Security Matters. I'm Andrew, the security guy. Ryan Schoenfeld is with us from RAS Watch. And this is uh, some forward-leading security technology. RAS Watch has got a GSOC um, sort of as a service. Ryan, you were relating to us how um, the ability to package a lot of really the kind of things a Fortune 500 GSOC would have and deliver that to customers um, almost as if it was their own. Talk, talk, expand on that a little bit more for us, um, sort of the range of service offerings and what, uh, what you found the appetite the consumers had. You know, what, what did they want the most that they, they, they didn't have or that you were able to bring that they hadn't considered? Sure. Um, yeah, I'd say that the, the majority of companies that we talk to that have uh, SOC or GSOC programs internally, uh, very few of them are actually truly global programs. 
Um, very few of them offer services to the company that go much beyond the video and access control components. Um, and so one of the things that there's been a lot of appetite for is our uh, intelligence and travel tracking uh, for employees um, and certainly the mass communications piece. Now, uh, probably obvious that in these pandemic times, uh, travel tracking has kind of stopped, um, but uh, presumably corporate travelers will start picking up again and, and hitting the road um, in the coming months. And so we anticipate that service picking up again uh, when that happens. Hey, do you think there'll be an appetite for um, knowing if it's a COVID hotspot? <laughs> like, like, you know, because you got to fly people in and out of these places, right? So what's the expected delay to get through the airport? Like Hawaii has a 14-day quarantine if you fly into here today, things like that. For sure. And, and that actually, as part of our program, started in, in late January oh. um, before there was even a lot of discussion around uh, travel restrictions and, and the pandemic here stateside. Uh, we were looking at uh, corporate travelers in Asia and Europe and, and other locations around the globe and monitoring what was happening in those countries with travel restrictions. But then again, as the U.S. started imposing uh, travel restrictions on people coming in, making sure that all the corporate travelers knew that they had to uh, be on a flight by this date and time or, you know, they might not be able to get back into the U.S. until, you know, who knows. Yeah, who knows when. Pretty interesting stuff, for, especially the business community. Um, is the uh, it, Do you have a feeling a lot of them are, are going to start traveling again? I mean, it's, uh, it's sort of been shut down, you know, and that's an interesting, I was kind of wondering, I know some of the really large organizations um, that, that we work with are, are not traveling all year, and they've already announced that. I was like, wow, those are, it's kind of early in the year to be making statements like that, but that's uh, the way they're looking at things. Yeah, there's going to be a, a lot less travel for sure. Um, you know, it, it's been interesting actually talking to customers as they look to uh, getting back to work, you know, physically, I suppose. Uh, you know, everybody's been working from home, but uh, what's different? Travel programs, a huge part of that. Um, how much of their corporate offices are actually going to reoccupy, if any. Um, you know, the, the cost savings to organizations by uh, reduced travel and, um, you know, we have one company that we work with that said they're going to save $3 million this year just in not providing lunches and snacks to the uh, employees. Wow. Uh, so it's, there's a lot of secondary expenses that, uh, um, that that's been interesting to monitor. But I do think there's some businesses that have to travel, um, but I think there's going to be a, a, a more complicated internal approval process um, to get approved to travel, whereas before a lot of people just booked their flights and jumped on planes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Hey, we had a question from our audience and I hadn't really considered it, but uh, what's stopped the people who, you know, you went in, you've got a cloud offering, cloud GSOC, GSOC as a service, depending on how you want to call it. Um, what's stopping people from moving into, into acceptance or adopting a cloud-based service that you've ran into? Yeah, I think uh, part of it is the kind of unknown that we talked about a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and not understanding it. I think, you know, there's kind of a big picture transition that the organization as a whole needs to look at. So if they're a largely on-prem company and, and security starts talking about going to the cloud, um, IT may not be comfortable with that strategy yet. Uh, we've also found in a lot of organizations that the IT folks may feel threatened by um, a move to cloud um, in that there may not be as much of a need for all of their positions at the company anymore. Um, so there's a whole host of things that um, factor in. Certainly um, cyber is, uh, is and should be a consideration, uh, but generally speaking, uh, most of the good cloud applications are probably more secure than most of the on-prem, um, you know, except in certain applications. Um, but we, we often, actually almost always, recommend third-party pen testing and um, a vetting process of, of the solution, whether it's going to be on-prem or hosted. Sure, yeah. And I have, I've run in, I mean, I think we've all run into these systems that have not, no one's touched them for two years. So there's been no patch work done. There's, and I mean, that means the Windows patch is nothing. You know, it's just sat there because it worked, right? You know, these, a lot of these systems are old and stable and they'll run on, old versions and people don't need new features. So they just sit there and print their badges and 
look at their reports once in a while. And it's interesting, you know, um, the, the dynamic nature of what's available through the cloud to me should bring, bring more, more um, appeal, especially when we talk about machine learning, starting to add algorithms to the existing data sets that we're building about these companies and the way they operate. Um, are you getting more requests for like business uh, intelligence out of the systems that you, you've got uh, in the cloud for these folks? It's funny. We propose a lot of business intelligence solutions, okay. um, not finding yet a great deal of adoption. Although um, post COVID, we're starting to see more interest in the types of analytics that people can pull from their infrastructure, whether it's to look at uh, occupancy stats or um, try to pull some semblance of social distancing data from turnstiles or, or other infrastructure. Um, you know, we're certainly working with uh, players that have cloud applications for the same thing. Um, I'd say some of the biggest things we're getting interest in right now from a cloud application perspective are things that are so simple, like um, system health monitoring, uh, mm -hmm. making sure that your cameras are actually working um, particularly as all of these sites are sitting vacant and, and remote. Sure. Uh, there's, you know, any security practitioner knows that uh, so many times you go back to look at the video and you realize that, that camera has been down for, for three months. And so there's, there's so many cheap solutions for those problems. So that's one of the things that um, we're getting a lot of requests for as a service right now. And then the other thing to your earlier point is uh, patches and updates as a service. So whether it's camera firmware or um, updating passwords on a somewhat regular basis. Um, again, a seemingly simple thing, but it's those little things that are, are often forgotten. Yeah, for sure. Well, um, I think we've got a minute or two left. Ryan, uh, what, uh, what, what advice would you give the industry uh, kind of looking forward, you know, from, uh, from the perspective of managed service provision, you know, pro uh, as being a managed service provider and then, um, you know, also, the, as we as we sort of exit this space, is there is there even more room or more is there a, uh, even more leverage that you can use as a managed service provider uh, to bring more value to the industry and to you know security offerings for a customer? Well, I think the the big thing we're finding now is as companies look to emerge from you know these times, and this answer is a little different than I'd have given you a few months ago. Um, cost savings is probably one of the number one drivers of the decision process right now. And so managed services and cloud and, um, you know, reducing that internal footprint and kind of the, the redundancy of everybody having their own uh, programs and, and duplicating things across sites, whether it's, you know, a service like RAS Watch or, or any other managed service or cloud offering, I think is going to offer the types of cost reductions that just about every company is looking for right now. Awesome. Well, thank you, Ryan. Again, I really appreciate your time today. I know you're, you're a busy guy. Um, so we appreciate you sharing your, your insights with us and uh, we wish you well. I uh, hope the West Coast comes back to life. Hope our economy gets cranking and I uh, hope to see you soon in like in person, you know, at one of our events. That would be great. <laughs> awesome. Take care, man. Aloha. Everybody be safe out there and wash your hands.